whenever I'm about to introduce a speaker, they usually give me some sort of biography or a profile, or they send me to their LinkedIn account, which is full of you know, fancy words and all the work that they've done. But what I like to do is go to their Twitter account and spend just a few minutes scrolling through their tweets and replies and just look for something that I think that would be a much better way to introduce them. And the reason I do that is partly for my own entertainment, of course, a little bit for your entertainment, but mostly because Sid here right now is stood there going, oh my God, what did I say? And he's racking his brains and he's getting nervous because he's wondering what might I have said? And actually, I couldn't find anything too terrible. You keep your Twitter very clean. Um, if you look through his Twitter feed, because uh, I think you know your Twitter feed is is kind of, it's a window into who you are and what you do. Because you know you just you just talk and you chat and you answer questions and maybe you ask a few. It's kind of like human. So it's clear that you know a thing or two about startups. It's clear that he knows a little bit about big companies and and uh, maybe let's call them big organizations. A little bit about policy and that kind of management, but what I found most fascinating is that he loves to trade movie recommendations for your knowledge about other subjects. So maybe if we've got no questions at the end, I'm going to ask you to recommend me a movie. This is an interactive presentation. Sid doesn't know this yet, but he's actually a little bit nervous. And what he needs from you is a big warm welcome in order to make him feel comfortable on this stage with you guys. So it's your job to make a round of applause. You can clap, you can cheer, you can whistle, you can shout and scream, including you, Buzz, don't hide, don't hide. So loud that the people in the other side of the auditorium look over and go, oh my God, what's going on over there? Can you do that? Because if you can do that, he will be 10 times better just because of that energy. I promise, right? All right, so ladies and gentlemen, all the way, where, you came in from the UK, right? All the way from an hour ago in London, a huge campus party, round of applause. This is where you get going. Are you ready? Wow. This is going to be a tough crowd, man. Are you ready? All the way from the UK, campus party, warm, welcoming, round of applause for Sid. No. No. You did awesome. He ran from the other side of the auditorium and was clapping on the way. That was pathetic. And I know you had yeah. lunch uh, okay. an hour ago and you're kind of a bit <sighs> from lunch. We're going to do that one more time and you guys are going to be awesome. All the way from the UK, I want you to give a huge, warm campus party round of applause for Sid. Thank you. Uh, that, that was probably the best introduction I've, anybody's ever made in the history of introductions. No hyperbole at all. You should be like on WWE as the hype man. Uh, I'll if take you aren't it. already. Can you, can you hook me up? I have some, I'll make some calls. All right, sounds good, yeah. thanks. Thank you. Um, I actually didn't just come an hour ago. I was uh, yesterday in um, The Hague at uh <coughs> Impact Startup Fest uh, where I did some presentations and so on. But uh, thanks to Bas here for inviting me. Um, so yeah, today we're going to talk about if you want to set up a startup, what are the kind of general things you should be thinking about? Um, so I'm going to go through you know, some tips, tricks, uh, trends, and then stuff you can take away. Uh, I will also be around after the talk. Uh, please come and chat to me. Um, but let's get started. Turn it on. Turn on technology. Is it on? Tell you what, you keep talking. Yeah. Okay. Right. Uh, let me quickly introduce myself. On the left there, I uh, did a book with my dad called, yeah, cheers, man. Thank you. Uh, called Startup City. It's about Bangalore. Uh, 10 case studies of entrepreneurs, first generation, middle class entrepreneurs. Uh, it's meant for people who work in, for example, call centers and, you know, don't really have, uh, they, they don't know who Steve Jobs is. They don't really care who Steve Jobs is, uh, rest his soul, but, you know, something more accessible. Uh, I'm on the board of uh, Volunteer Center Hackney. It's a small charity based in uh, one of the boroughs of London. Um, 
I used to run something called Net Squared London, which is a meetup group for people interested in tech for social good. Uh, I go on Sky News sometimes uh, to talk about India. Um, please, if you go on there, don't comment about my tie. My mom's told me about it. It's not funny any longer. Uh, I blog for the LSC on media and uh, India broadly. And finally, right now I work at Nesta on two projects, European Digital Forum and Startup Euro Partnership. Um, check out Nesta. They have tons and tons of resources. If you're into, into innovation of any sort, whether it's health or um, you know technology, any sort of innovation, Nesta is uh, kind of a one-stop shop for anything innovation related. Okay, enough about me. Um, let's start with the definition. What is an entrepreneur? And there's two, there's two definitions I've put on here. Can, can everybody see them? Top right, bottom left. What's the difference? You, sir. It's an interactive session. I, I don't know if you were there for that part, but what, what's the difference between these two? Say, sorry, say it again. I couldn't hear you. Say that again. Uh, below is a manager and above is somebody with passion. So between this and that. So there's two definitions. That's the Miriam Webster and this is dictionary.com. There's a subtle difference between the two definitions. Anybody spot it? Initiative, close. It's actually the word any right here. That's the only difference. And that's why I think this is a better definition of an entrepreneur because it's in the purest sense, anybody who can identify a need, any need, uh, and fill it. Uh, some pe people call it a primordial urge, uh, independent of product, service, industry, whatever, any need. If you f fulfill that, you're an entrepreneur. Um, all the other stuff, I mean, look at, it's colorful and so on. I'm not going to explain it. It's self-explanatory. That's why I put it as a diagram. Uh, another way to define it, another way to think about it maybe, is it's the confluence of these three things, talent, temperament, and technique. So you're talent, but you know, you have all these um, personality traits, but there's also temperament and how you convert that into something that's practical. And that's technique. This is a slide I really like. Uh, it's taken from a really interesting paper uh, written by a Canadian as well about what the spectrum of entrepreneurship is, right? Try not to fall off the stage here. Uh, if you cut it down kind of the center, on the left is nonprofits, on the right, for profits. You can be a social entrepreneur up until a certain point. And then beyond that, you're just a regular entrepreneur, so a commercial entrepreneur, let's call it. On this side, it's mission driven. It's all about what your mission is. On this side, your basic mission is generating profit. Under that, there's dependency. So places like the Salvation Army, um, Sick Kids Foundation, where somebody comes up to you on the street and says, please, can you donate uh, to this cause? A little bit more self-sufficient are things like Ashoka. Has, have people heard of Ashoka? No? Check them out, yeah. Two words, what would you describe them as? Yes, very close. So they have fellows who go around and uh, they do social innovation across the world. Then we have for-profit, um, but still with a social entrepreneurship badge. So Grameen Bank, have, have you guys heard of Grameen Bank? They kind of pioneered microcredit in countries like Bangladesh and so on. Very interesting organization. And finally, we have the general you know, entrepreneurship, uh, profit-based, Microsoft, Apple, and so on. This is, this is a really interesting way to think about where you want to situate yourself based on what your mission is, right? If that's the way you're thinking about things, this is a in good, good way to place yourself along that spectrum. Right. So this is a BuzzFeed uh, infographic. So is your startup idea taken? I'm sure people have ideas here. This is a good way to check, right? So you have, everybody's heard of Uber, right? 
Tinder, right? Airbnb. So everybody's heard of these three. And then there's Birchbox, which is, if I'm not mistaken, a cosmetics delivery uh, company that you get every month or week or something. Yeah, subscription-based uh, subscription cosmetics. cosmetics yeah. And then, of course, everybody wanted. So there was Birchbox for your dog food and Birchbox for well, the men's stuff. And Wow, yeah. So a Birchbox for dogs, yeah, it's called BarkBox. There you go. Right? So this is kind of, it's a bit funny, but, you know, Airbnb for underwear, that's still not taken. The one, uh, by the way, the ones in the blue boxes are not taken, so those are up for grabs. I think the best slash worst ones, um, Birchbox for pizza, that's not bad. Airbnb for beards, Airbnb beard. Uh, please don't do Tinder for kids. Uh, yeah, there's Uber for camping. This is just a little bit of, you know, one of these funny BuzzFeed things that's actually kind of true that this is how people think about things now, you know? It's Uber of X now, or Airbnb of X. That's what makes it so funny, the fact that it's true. Yeah, it's very close to reality, a uh, bit too close. But yeah, this is just one of the funny slides between the, the kind of more serious slides. But business model canvas, you guys were doing this, Nick and uh, friends uh, in that room over there earlier. Um, I feel like you should <laughs> talk <laughs> about this. Wow. Uh, I mean, maybe we should ask the audience, who's familiar with the business model canvas already? Oh, oh perfect. About, about three quarters. So I think yeah. you can get away with the short version for this. OK, OK. I'll, I'll give you some tips then. First, use post-it notes. <laughs> do, do not write onto the business canvas, because by the end of the day or end of the session, you would have scratched it out five times. And that only works if you have uh, sticky notes to write on and then take off and put on. Um, really quickly, I mean, things. Th th this is a quite basic way to think about what, uh, how you segment your business, right? So, who are your customers? What do they see? How do they feel? What do they do? You know, think. Put yourself in their place. Who are these people? Um, what's your value proposition? Why? Why would your customers buy yours, your product or service versus somebody else's? Um, you know, in terms of their customer relationships. How are you defining their journey? What is your customer journey going to be? Um, in terms of activities, what is unique about your product or service that differentiates it from other people? Um, and then in terms of partnerships, I would say think about what you can get away with not doing rather than just thinking about what your partnerships are. So basically, what you can offload onto someone else. Um, and costs, obviously, this is the biggest thing. Uh, what are the major cost drivers, and what's the link between that and your revenue stream? So that's something you should really think about. So take that business model canvas and then stick it in here, and then maybe have a beer or two, and then think about the big picture. This is the big picture. So this is the rest of the world or the business universe, right? So on the one hand, there's market forces here. So what sort of na needs and demands are there in the entire uh, industry and the world and so on? Why, why is, how, how are you getting revenue? Down here is macroeconomic factors. You can't really control them, but think about them. If there's a global financial crisis going on, maybe don't launch like you know, some sort of fintech application. Think, think about things like that. Um, then there's industry forces. So. How does your supply chain and so on work? Uh, what, who are the new entrants? What sort of thing can you substitute in terms of products? Is there already something there? Are you just replacing something? Uh, and finally, the key trends. What are the technology trends, socioeconomic trends, and regulatory trends? Any, any questions here quickly? This is, this is a lot to take in. You're basically thinking about everything ever to do with a business, so. <laughs> I was going to say, I, I know yeah. I said the short version, but you know, usually this takes a good day or so to work out with the team. Sometimes yeah. you squeeze it into a half day. So if it sounds a little overwhelming, don't panic. Yeah, I, I would actually say the business model canvas will take you about half day to a day. And this should take you not less than a week. Because you will think of something, and then you'll go off, you'll read the newspaper, you'll come back and be like, oh, I didn't think of these three things. So take your time. Don't rush it. This is something that people uh, who start businesses fail to do quite often, and essentially you're shortchanging your own you know, success by not um, 
doing this part of the exercise because you want to rush into something, you have the idea, you want to capitalize it, but believe me, taking those extra three or four days to get on top of this will serve you in the long term. Okay, this is, this is another fun slide in the middle again. When is too late to start, right? So we have people who, you know, a little bit older end of the spectrum here, younger end of the spectrum here. So, you know, uh, we have uh, Mark Zuckerberg and, you know, all, all these people. But my personal opinion is if by the age of 35 you haven't started some venture, it doesn't have to be a company, a successful company, a whatever it is, if you haven't done something entrepreneurial by the time you're 35, chances are you probably are not going to do it going forward. I don't think this crowd, uh, there's anybody who hasn't done probably three or four ventures by the time they're 35, so I'm probably preaching to the choir, but this is just my personal opinion. There's no empirical evidence whatsoever to support it. This is just anecdotal and what I've realized, but you know, take, take, take it as you will. Right. This, this is a, this is an interesting slide I'm going to spend a little bit of time on. Um, and people ask me this quite often. What is the difference between innovation and entrepreneurship? Um, they use sometimes interchangeably uh, by people which, you know, uh, it, I think that's a mistake. And the reason being, um, you can have innovation without entrepreneurship, such as NASA or the Manhattan Project, which developed the uh, atomic bomb that was just dropped uh, in Hiroshima and Nagasaki, where President Obama was speaking uh, earlier today. At the same time, you can have entrepreneurship without innovation. So think about generic pharmaceuticals, right? So you're, you, you know there's a market in India, for example. There's a market for generic pharmaceuticals. You can make those quite easily, but you're not innovating. You're taking something that already has been developed elsewhere, and you're just doing it for one, say, 500th of the cost. So that's entrepreneurial, but it's not really innovative. So that's kind of the basic difference. Um, another one, at the heart of entrepreneurship, you have profit and risk. Those are the two main drivers of entrepreneurship. Um, if it doesn't affect a market, it's not, you know, um, just because it impacts a market doesn't make it innovative necessarily. It can be, you know, between the two. Uh, the, I think the next point is really f fundamental is that innovation is profit agnostic, meaning it doesn't depend on, um, at the micro level, it's, it, it's indifferent. And everybody's favorite uh, meme on the internet, Nikola Tesla, he died penniless. Whereas Edison basically stole a bunch of his inventions and he's, you know, the greatest investor known to man and he died like a millionaire. So innovation itself is profit agnostic. It doesn't depend on on profit. A um, little bit further in is innovation and invention. And as it says here, for something to be inventive, to become innovation, it must be used. So there's, there's a subtle differences here, and I would urge you to c think a little bit about them, because how you use them is the same as what actually it ends up being. So you think you're being really innovative, but maybe you're just being entrepreneurial. I mean, I'm, I'm not saying one is better than the other, one is worse than the other. That's for you to decide. But there is a difference. Remember that. Okay, let's move on. <coughs> uh, before starting, few things to think about. Right? Um, let's 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 let, let's take maybe just three or four. Let's not go through all this whole list. F most important one, I think, is about taking risks. So it's not everybody knows it's risky and so on, but it's not simply taking risk. It's about how you manage that risk, how you mitigate that risk. That's really important. Second, it takes time. Nobody's an overnight sensation. Zuckerberg, you take whoever you want. Nobody just overnight becomes a success. There's tons and tons and years and years of hard work that they put in, and only then. Five to seven years, I would say, is kind of an average. Uh, luck plays a role, you know? You may have done a ton of stuff and tried to get everything to market, but some other schmuck, you know, steals half your thing, and then suddenly some VC comes in, swoops in, takes his thing, takes it to market, and they get a success. You know, luck plays a role, not just in business, in life. So accept that. Um, first make it work, then make it better. It's a cliche, but you know. Uh, also costs, they're like fingernails, keep them trim. 
keep them trim because that's going to be your biggest uh, biggest issue at, when you go to sleep at night. It's you know how can I pay my employees? How can I pay my creditors? How can I get this done at less cost? Try and cut wherever you can. Lastly, ideas are worthless until you get them out there and see what they actually do. You know, talking about it and you know coming pitching and so on are great, but you have to try at least to make it work. Okay, you've done that, but now you've failed. Dealing with failure, right? So this, this is kind of the most well bandied about uh, statistic about startups. Nine out of 10 startups fail, right? What does that actually mean? You know, as a researcher, for me it's interesting, what are the reasons? Why do these startups fail? You can't just say, oh, there was this, uh, no, why do they actually fail? There are the reasons, I don't want to read them out, I think everybody can see them. So, you know, the business model is not being viable or there's no market for it and so on. Um, you ran out of cash, like I said, you know, costs are overrun, uh, there's no traction, you're outcompeted. there's all these reasons. Um, so, money matters, you know, but so does your team. These are, this is kind of a balancing act that you always have to do. Um, Perform a post-mortem. That's probably the best thing you can do if you fail in business is to take some time off, go, you know, stay with your parents, stay with a friend, go camping, clear your mind, come back and say, blue sky, what happened? What went wrong? What could we have done better? So it's a post-mortem. Try seeing what the reasons were for failure. Uh, hindsight, obviously, 2020. And a general question, is there a cult around failure now? You know, there's a people, people talk about failure as if it's cool. Is that a good thing? You know, I, I don't know. It's a, that's why I put a question mark there. Um, CB Insights has. Uh, have you guys heard of CB Insights? Anybody? Nobody? Okay. This is not a plug because they're not paying me. In fact, we are paying them to get their service. You can sign up for free, but CB Insights has some of the best writing about ventures and startups and uh, so on. They have a free newsletter. Check it out. Subscribe. Okay, we're getting towards trends now, right? So this, this was a big trend, this mythical beast, the unicorn, right? So it was a year, year of the unicorn for the last few years, you know, all these huge one billion plus uh, valued companies and they had super fast growth, tons of VC cash, uh, and they, reach, they, they get money before they reach scale. So Uber, Airbnb, a bunch of these are, are good examples. But now what's happening is money's drying up. All the ideas are kind of, uh, you know, they've been tried and tested and so on. What are VCs looking for? They're looking for cockroach, cockroaches. As, as, um, so that's a company that builds slowly and steadily, uh, keeps an eye on revenue and profits, and spending is kept in check. So why is this happening? Like I said, funding is drying up. People have funded so many useless ideas that have failed that they're like, okay, we need something that's, you know, a cockroach that literally cockroaches can live for six weeks without food. They don't care what they eat. They will eat any shit, pardon my French. Um, they don't need sugar. They can live on glue, hair, things like that. They lack glamour. They're not big, you know, they don't, uh, they don't need to be flashy to attract a mate and so on that a lot of different insects do. If you can't tell, these are all allegories for startups, but... Yeah, I think you got that. Um, and you don't see them, and they move really quickly. You see a cockroach, oh, it's gone. Where, where, where it go? Where, you know, that's that's kind of what people are looking for. I know it doesn't translate directly, but this is the closest closest that I've found. So you got to be agile, move quickly, move fast, cut costs, lay off staff. You know, um, move out of those like luxury offices in downtown LA or San Fran or something. Go 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 to Montana. Go you know go 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 to a village somewhere. Um, Kill projects that are not working. Pivot if you need to. So, I mean, th th this, this is a trend that I've seen, and I think that this is something that's going to happen more and more. These kind of big bucks uh, valuations are on the way out. I mean, people, people now, from what I read, uh, just to get to an IPO, people are struggling now, and they're getting IPO specialists and, and so on. Whereas in the past two, three years ago, people, you know, IPOs were, anybody could do it. You know, you and I set up something today, and Within six months, we could have an IPO and raise, you know, a couple million at least. Right, okay. 
This is some startup wisdom. Just I'll give you five seconds to look at it while I drink some water. The good thing is I've distilled them into seven points because who wants 20 points when you can have seven? Or sorry, 10, <laughs> excuse me, half. Eh, that's good enough. Um, I'll just go through a few of them. I mean, you, like I said, everybody can read these then large enough font. Um, accept defeat, you know, with humility. I know, I know it's hard and I've taken a number of falls and it, it takes some time to get into, but Try, try and say you're sorry, you know. Believe me, that, that does so much, not just for the people or your customers and so on, but for yourself. Saying, I'm sorry, you know, we screwed up. Uh, let, us, let us try again. Um, entrepreneurs move on. Businesses fail. Entrepreneurs move on. Remember that. Your business may fail. You haven't failed. The business has failed. Move on. Move on. Uh, be honest with your customers, like I said. Uh, this number point number six, this is one thing that I really like about startups and entrepreneurship and so on and kind of the ecosystem around entrepreneurship in Europe but also in Silicon Valley and pretty much anywhere. People share ideas. People talk to each other. You know, they're open. And there's the kind of honor system that somebody's not going to steal your idea or, you know, steal whatever IP you have and move on and try and capitalize on that. But, you know, there's a lot of mentorship. Uh, that goes on. People, you know, who are more experienced talk to people who are junior and share their experience with them and give them contacts and get in touch, you know, with this person, that person. Here's the card. Here's the number. Pay it forward. It, th beyond any physics or biology or any rule there is in science, one thing I've found is what goes around comes around. So if you're good to people around you, that'll come back. Believe me. I know this sounds very kind of airy fairy like a uh, you know i i should be uh, sitting around a campfire and singing kumbaya but believe me this this is how it works everywhere i've seen it um number 8 spend time with family and friends you know yeah your business drives you that's what keeps you going that's what makes you who you are but family and friends those are the people who will stand by you when you're failing or you're doing well and you want to share it those are the most important people never forget that uh, try and stay healthy, eat somewhat well if you can, uh, stay fit, you know, maybe work out once in a while or play games or, you know, and by games I mean actual sports, not on Xbox. Um, yeah, so th th these, these are the kind of things that um, while writing this book, uh, these are the th kind of quotes, throwaway quotes that people said it. A lot of cliches in there, I realize, but there are a reason that they are cliches. Um, okay, and I think this is my last slide, which I don't really need. This is something I did yesterday at, uh, at The Hague. I was talking about how not to do social innovation, for example. So people love talking about Airbnb, Uber, and so on. But if you don't make it accessible to everyone, so poor people or people who don't have college education, uh, you're not really doing something that, in my opinion, is worthwhile. Um, you know, just making money, is that, is that, every, is that it, you know? So it, if that's it, then, you know, good luck to you. But, um, yeah, try, try and make it inclusive. Try and make it so that other people uh, who haven't got the means or opportunity also can uh, use your product or service. Uh, that's all I really have on that. But well, uh, I'd yeah. love to just chime in on the end there. I, I talk sure. to a lot of people who want to be entrepreneurs, a lot of big companies trying to figure out what a new product or service could be. And I say, look, if you're going to spend this time innovating something, you can innovate something that makes the world worse and make money from it. Or you could make money from innovating that makes something the world a better place. It'll take the same amount of effort, but one of them is going to feel much better. Yeah. Um, lots and lots of hardcore information in there, man. I saw so many people taking photographs so they can get that stuff I, at home. I can share the slides. So I was going to say, so the other thing is, uh, is there some way that these folks can get in, in, in touch with you? Uh -huh. I know you're on Twitter because I was looking through your Twitter feed. Yes. It's probably all the way back at the beginning. And yes, of course, we do have time for Q&A. So if you've got a question. I have so cards and stuff. So, I so much go. information. Yep. They're probably still processing it. But the first question is coming in. Hello, sir. What's your name and what is your question? Hello, my name is Matthew. Um, uh, you told, you just mentioned um, the uh, a culture of failure. 
and you were doubting it, if it was a good thing or not. But a few minutes later, you said, okay, if you fail, you don't fail by yourself, but your company just fails. But why do you doubt uh, the culture of failure is a good thing or a bad thing? Uh, what, a, if, what, a, what a great question, because there's a subtle difference here. If, if you were paying attention, I asked it as a question. So I was saying, is there a cult of failure? Is that something that's happening? I don't know. It's something that we need to discuss. So I think I know the answer to this. Can I give my opinion of course, as well? Of course. I think you're right. Right now, there are so many people talking about failure like it's awesome and it's incredible. And particularly here in the Netherlands, we're not very tolerant of failure. So we've got to become more tolerant of it. But we've got to remember that failure is not a goal. Right? Nobody sets up a business to go bankrupt. Nobody gets married to get divorced. It's not the outcome that you desire. But if you can make that failure small enough and painless enough that it's a bit like just tripping over on the sidewalk and then you get up and keep going, those kind of failures are good because you can learn from them, but they're not fatal. Yeah, so I'll just tell you, for example, I wrote a blog about, uh, so I, one of the projects I work on Nesta is called the European Digital City Index where we measure uh, kind of the health of city level ecosystems for digital entrepreneurs, startups and scale ups. Um, Digitalcityindex.eu, check it out. but one of the themes is about entrepreneurial culture and within that theme we have certain variables and that is one of them is tolerance for risk but also views on failure so what do people think about you when they see that you have failed and i wrote a blog about uh, brussels because brussels actually came quite high in the index people were not expecting that and i spoke to a professor of entrepreneurship there and he said in in belgium it's like a black mark you know People think that you failed in your business and you know they whisper behind your back and they're like, oh, this guy, this guy. You know, like you said, that needs to change, you know. It doesn't mean because your business has failed that you're like a bad person, you know. <laughs> you're, not, you're not setting up a business to be a failure. Nobody does that. So um, kind of changing those attitudes and so on I think is super important. Yeah, thank you. All right, maybe now the question from the audience, anybody? There's a ton of information. I'm, if there's no questions, I'm just going to come and sit next to someone and have a chat because, you know. Sure, you can have a second one. We'll call it buy one, get one free. Is your name still Matthew? Uh, no, my name is Hank now. <laughs> <laughs> um, do you have one reason uh, not to start, uh, not to be an entrepreneur? Wow, that's a question I haven't heard before. That's pretty cool. Oh. Uh, hmm. I suppose if you want to be maybe a doctor or a lawyer, then don't be an entrepreneur. Or you could be oh, both. I, think I don't think they're mutually exclusive. I think you could be an entrepreneurial lawyer. Doctor yeah. might be a bit hard, certainly here in the West. Yeah. Um, Th there was a question here, wow, the gentleman here. Yeah, but, um, that, that's an awesome <coughs> question. I'm stealing that. Is there that. a reason? There's definitely reasons. But you know, if your heart's not in it or if you don't think you're risk averse, for example, then maybe don't get into it. Or maybe if you know that kind of person that needs a, an incredible amount of structure and stability. Yeah. Two things that do not come with entrepreneurship. Yeah, if your personality doesn't really, isn't entrepreneurial, I would say maybe don't do it. <laughs> but I would always say try it and fail and yeah. then, you know, choose otherwise. You'll find uh, out really quickly whether <laughs> it's for you or not. So. We, we got another question. Uh, what's your name and then what's your question? Uh, my name is Paul and I have a question which is kind of in the same category. Is is there a reason why not to uh, look for funding to try and keep funders out out of your project? So that's actually happening quite a lot from all the stuff that I'm seeing uh, in the markets and so on. People are, one big reason is because you don't want to be influenced by the people who are funding in you. So there's always strings, right? No. Nowadays, no longer people just give you money and say, here's, here's a billion, do what do you want? No, it's, you have to do all these things, you have to hit these benchmarks, these are the milestones you have to meet and so on. Um, do people watch Silicon Valley on HBO? Anybody? Yeah, it's not so it's, well known here. It's one of the funniest, top three funniest show I would say right now. And if you're into tech, uh, it's on HBO, Silicon Valley, and the story over there. So. You know, this guy, he, he founds a company, it's a compression algorithm, whatever. And uh, basically, it becomes so successful that the board gets in and says, you're too successful for your own good, so we have to replace you. I mean, it's a, it's, it's a satire, but 
things like that happen, you know. People are like, oh, it's growing too quickly, you know, C calm down. And you're like, wait a minute. That's what I wanted all along, you know. So um, that's one, one reason is because there's strings attached. And if you don't want to do what other people say uh, and you want to go, go it on your own, then that's one reason not to take money. Uh, the second is you might grow too quickly and then you have to have a down round after a little b while. And that loads of companies are doing it now. They're having a down round. And then you have to kind of scramble again and get to get back on that same pace. So um, be careful what you wish for. You might say, oh, you know, we, we want a VC to notice us. We want to get in. But eventually, it might be that you just want to grow at your own pace. That's, that's kind of what I would say is be careful who you're getting money from, where it's coming from, what are the terms and conditions. Um, and there's, that's the point where you know things like mentorship and managerial assistance come into play. You talk to somebody who's gone through that, who's done that, who's on the other side, and would want to help you without kind of any strings attached. That's that's a great way to do it. I mean, it's as simple as going on LinkedIn and searching for it. You know, mentors, city, and and uh, your your whatever your sector is. Yeah. I'd add one more thing, and that is, uh, and maybe you're actually thinking of raising money. You know, that's that's probably what triggered the question. One, think about what do you need that money for? What are you going to spend it on? And then figure out if you can do that without the money. Right. right? No investor says, oh, you need a million. Sure, here it is. They're going to say, what are you going to spend it on? Yeah. And so when you figure out what you're going to spend it on, there might be other ways of achieving that without the money. And if you're talking about big money, particularly here in the Netherlands and Europe, don't underestimate the amount of time it takes to raise money. You know, raising 10 million here in the Netherlands is pretty much a full-time job. And that, you know, for anyone who's worked in Silicon Valley, that sounds ridiculous, but it is. And remember, as soon as you got your 10 million, you now have to spend it. It's not there to pay your salary. It's there to grow your business and make a return for your investor. So now you've got to figure out how you're going to raise the next round. So you get caught in this loop, yeah. and then all of a sudden you've got a team of five people who do nothing but fundraising, which is completely not the point of why you started a business. Or at least for most people. Some some advice that I've seen, which is a bit counterintuitive, and I don't know if it's whether it's right or not, is some somebody said this at a, one, one of the presentations. I was at, if you want two million, ask for five million, and then you'll get you know one million in the end. So, but that that you know I, I don't know. I, I, do you just ask for more money for the sake of asking for it? I mean. Well, that seems to be working out for uh, Slack and Snapchat, but maybe they're the exceptions. Exceptions. Yeah. Hi. I'm wondering if you've got a question, because I've seen you, you know, patiently sucking in all the information. Well, um, not specifically. I'm actually working for a big company, and one of our target groups are startups. So it's very interesting to get a bit of uh, right. yeah, how they think and what's their world. Who are you working for? Uh, Zigo, one of the sponsors. Yeah. Um, so that's the other job that I have at Nesta is working on corporate startup collaboration. So let's have a chat after, because <laughs> I don't know who else is actually interested in that. I'm doing a presentation in a bit uh, about that, but, but I'll, we can chat, yeah. Any Others? more questions in the audience? Yeah, one behind me, I think, yeah. Yeah, thank you. Uh, my name is Roland. Um, I'm thinking about starting up my own company, but I don't have any technical skills. And since you know the technical aspect is uh, one of the most important things, do you actually uh, advise me to get some basic understanding about the technical skills, or do you say like, okay, don't even get there, just work together with other people who are really skilled in that sp uh, particular uh, particular field? I would say do both. Okay. Uh, getting getting your own technical skills, you want to understand what these people are talking about in meetings. You don't want to just be there sitting like uh, you know. And, uh, you want to know what's going on. So at least a basic base level of understanding, I think everybody should have. But yeah, if you don't have it, don't try and pretend like you do. Get a CTO, you know, get somebody else who has, those knowledge, who has that knowledge, those skills and so on, on board, and they can, they can do the kind of heavy lifting for you, but you definitely need to have some baseline or you're gonna be lost. And uh, you know, they may take it in a different direction, and you're like, whoa, Two months later, you're like, what just happened? You know, why didn't, why didn't you tell me you were doing this? And they, they'll say, oh, yeah, we did. We sent you this deck, you know. And because you didn't know what was going on, you're just like, yeah, yeah, sure, sure. You, were, you kept it going. So don't, don't let that happen to you. It never hurts to learn more stuff. Okay. 
What sort of what sort of company or, or product are you thinking of uh, building? Nah, I was actually thinking about uh, the nation crowdfunding platform, but I already talked to several parties in, uh, and I already found out that there are actually already too many crowdfunding platforms There's already in the Netherlands. So, yeah, my wa it already stopped at the market research. I mean, if you have a specific, so like say crowdfunding for food, or you know something like that, if you have something super niche, maybe go with it. But even that's already being like there's there's loads of those so. Yeah. All right. I see one more question up uh, on the other side of the audience. I love these events. They keep me so fit. <laughs> Thanks. Hi. What's your name? Question. So more than a question, actually, a comment to you. First of all, I really loved your comment earlier about um, failure, because I think that in Europe, a lot of times it's shown like in America it's normal to fail and I actually I believe failure is something bad and you should work to not fail right just as you said but obviously if you fail well you did your best but um, I didn't really like your comment you that you just where you just said raising 10 million dollars in Silicon Valley is that easy because I speak with a lot of European entrepreneurs and that's what they think but in real, it's really, really hard in, in Silicon Valley as well. And um, normally you are getting fun you get funding from friends and family, so people that know you. Mm. And um, once you have some things where you can prove your model, you can show that actually people like it, then you start getting the big amount. Just, just sorry, can, can I just jump in to defend him there? I don't think that's really what he said. I think what he said was, once you raise 10 million, then there's this kind of cycle of... Right. So he, he's kind of right. It, and and it's, it's nuanced feedback, right? I mean, you know, we've got a mixed audience here. Um, conceptually, raising 10 million in, in Silicon Valley, there are far more people who've got that kind of money to spend. But of course, there is also far more competition chasing that money down. I'm not saying you don't have to work for it. But it's not... <coughs> Sorry. But that's not really what I'm, what I'm saying. I mean, as a Dutch company, a German company, you can still go to Silicon Valley and raise those money, th that money, right? It's, it's more about, again, it's, it's a full-time job. It's a f you have to get to a certain level to raise those $10 million. Before that, you work with your personal network. Now, it's true that in California, people are more used to invest into tech. So you might have a buddy that knows you really well, and uh, he trusts in you, and he might write you a check for 200, 300, 400,000. So that, that, that might be true, but it's just like this, you know, when we talk about 10 million, I mean, 10 million, if you go to most of the venture funds that I know, at least, um, they tell you, well, who's your lead, right? So it's, uh, I mean, $10 million is, is something you don't just get a checkbook from someone, so. Absolutely agree. We could talk about this for a long time, I yeah, think. Yeah, and so 10 million is what? what? What are we talking, like Series C, B? I think it's uh, uh, Yeah. Yeah. So you, I mean, you have to show that you first raised, you know, two fifty. Right. So we're we're that you have done something. Yeah. That you raised money. We're, we're going to have this conversation over a beer, otherwise it's not going to be so fun for the audience. Yeah. <laughs> Maybe there is another question or two. Yeah. Hi. Let's start again with uh, what's your name? What's your question? Uh, my name is Rogier. Um, I'm a co-founder of my own company. I'm the CTO, mm -hmm. and I'm challenging with the with the fact that I am the only actual tech guy in the company. Mm. What's your top tip on finding a person or other persons or a network to bounce off your ideas to to um, to make your product even better? Which city are you based in? Um, we are officially located in Amsterdam. I'm okay. living in Utrecht. Okay. Have you tried just, for example, meetup groups, LinkedIn groups? Yes, I'm I'm visiting Facebook those, groups. but it's very difficult to find the the, the ones with the. Um, with with the with the right right people in it, I've been working for a tech company for 14 years before, right. and I had many colleagues to 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 interact with. Uh -huh. And now I'm some sort of I'm I'm a bit lonely, I could say. So it's difficult to get in touch very frequently with people um, who are in the same uh, level of expertise that mm -hmm. I can really interact with. Right. Very often those meetup groups have like um, students or people uh, looking just for nice talks to listen to and not really bringing uh, value instead of sure, sure. Uh, getting value. Yeah, so in, in this circumstances like this, I would say what I, I think I was saying to somebody else earlier is try and find maybe a mentor, uh, you know, and I don't know if they have this sort of things in, in this city here, but 
I know for sure in Amsterdam they have things like that. Maybe, do you know Startup Delta? Yeah, yeah. So try and reach out to them and say, hey, like, I know this is coming out of the blue. Th this is my issue. Do you have anybody I can talk to that you think would be uh, useful? I need to ask for specifically a tech mentor instead of a, a business yes. mentor because yes. I'm, I'm I have a couple of, of, of people helping, but they're all all in the business uh, part. Right, and that's you right. have already that you need something else. Yeah. So, yeah, yeah spe ask, ask specifically. Another angle you could try is you're not the only one who's in this position, so maybe you could look around at some of the other companies or startups who are around the sort of same phase that you're at, and go talk to and their techies and, and just say, right, and and you know it's about creating your own community. If if there isn't one out there. Well, yeah. you either stay lonely or you start to solve that problem, yeah. right? And so if it's not just you and you can find another one, then there's two of you. Cool. Now it's half as difficult. And if you get, yeah. well, I make it sound easy, but. <laughs> your, your idea. It's like right. Obviously. Yeah. Cool. Well, yeah, good luck with that. Uh, yeah. Oh, now the questions are flowing. We've got thank two. You. Hi. Yes. Uh, before you have a, million, um, a minimum value project, uh, project you know, big companies can can fund that uh, from uh, money they have, but uh, as a startup you can't uh, afford it because you you don't have uh, money only personal money. But what's uh, in your opinion the best idea to fund something or uh, you know to get the cost low and. Uh, uh, b in the in the meanwhile, for getting the mini minimum value product, so in in the in the time from nothing to something, right? How uh, how do you do it with so the costs? Sure, there's there's so there's a process issue. I would say maybe do something like prototyping. So you don't even actually need to do the MVP. You kind of mock it up and say this is what you want to do. In terms of fundraising, I would say right now, like a uh, friend there mentioned, there's alternative finance so maybe it's if it's something that's really cool you might want to crowdfund it for example um, another way to think about it is do you want to turn it into a social enterprise and get money from say the government or you know um, funders like the nonprofit funders like Ford Foundation something like that um, so think about it creatively if that's something that you know you want to do but if it's something that's purely commercial uh, people are going to be interested in it funders are going to be interested in it mock it up uh, you know do do as whatever you can with kind of friends and family money and say, look, I've got this, this is what I have, uh, and get feedback on it, you know? If, if you get loads of positive feedback, it means there is a need for it or demand for it, and then people will fund you. If people are like, oh, wait, not very interesting, or it's been done before, or something like that, then, you know, you haven't spent too much money, and you can kind of get out of the game without having lost too much. I'd add something to that, and, and that is if you really are quote unquote bootstrapping, right? That's that, that technical term for uh, uh, using the, the smallest amount of money that you've got available. All you've got to do is think about what's the m least amount of the work I've got to do to get me one step further forward. And so, unless you're building some sort of huge platform that's going to take years of technical work, which, which, you know, arguably is always going to be tough as a startup anyway, you probably don't need as much as you think you do to get one step further. So you can think about the long term, okay, I need to build this MVP and it needs to work and I need to be able to get it out to a thousand users. Or you could just say, what do I do to get to 10 customers and get their feedback and maybe they can start paying and now I got a little bit of money. Not a lot more, but a little bit. And how do I get from 10 to 100 and from 100 to 1,000? And then maybe you got to throw it away and start again but now you really know what you need to build so you can go faster. I think the non-technical term for that is baby steps. So oh yeah, that's the one. Tick, tick, small steps, you know. This guy's been waiting patiently. Hi, what's yeah. your name and Hello, uh, what's your question? My name is Ramco. I have sort of a question about when you're starting in a startup, uh, do you have to think about the long term? Because yeah, thinking about making a project and getting that up and running and making it work, that's sort of, how do you say it, the, the easy part and quite doable, but look at a product like uh, Pebble. You start it, you will get momentum, but basically you, or when you're enjoying the ride up, you will know that this thing will die in a few years because there is way bigger companies that can make better products in that area. Um, when do you step out of something like that? I've so so, so uh, if I understand the question, it's do you, should you think about the long term or how do you think about it? Uh, should you run a startup as a project or should you really run it as a company? Uh, so 
this is almost like is it a hobby or is it a business or like work yeah, it's more, uh, so I, I i i sort of feel the question and, yeah. and i don't think there is a right answer to be honest it's no. You know, you start going with what you know, and if you start with a big dream of how do I change the entire world or how do I get to Mars, yeah. then, you know, if you look at everything Elon Musk is doing now, SpaceX, Tesla, it's all about getting to Mars, mm -hmm. right? Tesla is funding his battery uh, business because they need the batteries, but guess what? He's going to need batteries on Mars, yeah. right? Solar City is designed specifically to get the best solar panel technology because guess what he needs on Mars? Yeah. Solar panels to get the energy and the batteries, right? And by the way, how do we get to Mars? Oh, I better have some rocket technology, right? So he's got that long-term vision. He's building all these companies to get us to Mars. Yeah. But it's also perfectly okay to say, hey, I found a problem. I just want to solve it, and I don't know where it's going to take me. Yeah. And when I've solved it for 10 people, who knows what comes next? There's no right or wrong answer. I mean, obviously, the longer term, the bigger plan you have, uh, you know, the, the, the more you're going to need to think about that. But... For most people, I think it's just taking the first step that is usually the hardest. Yeah. And I'm, I'm sensing some nervousness in you. Is, uh -huh. are, are you thinking about starting a, a project or a startup or something? Not, not directly, but I have quite a broad technical background, and we did quite a lot of little startup projects for bigger companies, say, uh, yeah, for the beauty industry, so for Vichy, L'Oreal. But those are all products that are like one shot, and afterwards nobody wants something in the same area yeah. again. So, and you will see the same with Kickstarter projects. A lot of them have yeah. nice momentum, and basically when, when they are capable of finishing the first product, then this whole business area is not feasible anymore. There, there is a lot of sort of burnout, like you said, you know, one and done kind of things. Um, if, if you ha have that kind of visionary, you know, kind of way of thinking, go for it. Like if you're an Elon Musk type or a Steve Jobs type. But if not, you know, try, try and do what you think as far as you can take it and then maybe somebody else jumps on board and says you know what i want to take your idea and turn it into this and if you're comfortable with that go with that you know and i would say uh, something that a lot of a lot of people are, are maybe not connecting in their minds in the startup world is that a product is not a business and a business is not a product they can be but they don't have to be so one product sometimes is not enough to build a business mm -hmm. so you have to think about what am i trying to do here do i want to build and release a product and it might be a one-hit shot, yeah. or do I actually want to build a business yeah. so I might need many one-hit shots, or maybe not a one-hit shot, but something that is more repeatable, scalable, et cetera, et cetera. And I think that ties in nicely to one of your very, very last points about think about why you're in this. What, what's yeah. your goal as a person? Yeah. Absolutely. I think we've got time for one more. I see one hand up, so we'll go back to uh, this side. <laughs> uh, first he was Matthew, then he was Henk. I'm wondering what he's coming up with now. Well, let's try Matthew again. Yeah. <laughs> uh, you were elaborating shortly on uh, social entrepreneurship. Mm. I'm considering my own social business. Uh, but you had this slide. Uh, there was a difference between mission-driven and something else. It wasn't very clear to me what you meant by that. So could you please elaborate a bit more on that? Yeah, you said non-profit with earned income strategies uh, for non-profit and for-profit with mission-driven strategies. But a non-profit organization is mission-driven as well. Yes. So what's the difference in there? Uh, so you're asking about nonprofits, so this side of it, and why they're... Uh, For-profit with mission-driven strategies? Yes. But uh, non-profit yeah. is mission-driven as well, because I have a mission. I want yes. to start my social business. Yes. So that's what this is, mission growth. Yeah. So this is almost purely for mission growth. Yeah, I think I see where it, it's, it's not easy from the audience, but I spotted it. Here you have profit as a subdiv section, and mission is your biggest thing. Over here, mission is a much smaller thing, and profit is your biggest thing. See how those two flip? Does that make a bit more sense for you now? Yeah. I, <laughs> you could probably make that a little clearer because yeah. it took me a little. I was like, huh, he's right, but now I see. These, it. these lines don't quite translate into. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Well, that was quickly solved, which means we got time for half a question. Does anybody have half a question? I'll, I'll be around on the side here if anybody wants to chat privately. All right. Well, 
Sid, thank you so much. Uh, I don't know if you know, it's campus uh, party tradition that everybody has to sleep in a tent. Yeah. I'm not sure you're going to be... I uh, past the matrix there. I was going to say, I'm not sure you're going to be hanging around long enough, so we'd love to give you a, a oh, campus party you. tent to take home, and uh, maybe you can set it up in the bedroom or the living room or, thank uh, you, so much. you know, for the kids or, or whatever. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, a huge round of applause for a lot of valuable information thank from you Sid. Thank you so much. Thank you, sir. Thank you.